True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Dale Yule worked hard to give his children all of the advantages that he didn't have as a child. His wife, Glee, provided a loving home, staying home with their daughter, Tiffany, and their son, Dana, and really showering them with attention as well as possessions. Growing up with every advantage, Dana Yule didn't appreciate what was being given. He always wanted more. He didn't inherit his parents' strong work ethic, but he wanted everything handed to him. And all the while, he was acting like he was a successful businessman in his own right. On April 19, 1992, the Yule home was robbed. And two days later, the housekeeper found the house torn apart with three dead bodies sprawled across the floors. Join us at the quiet end for 8 Million Reasons to Kill. We all want to give our kids the best things in life, but this may have backfired for Glee and Dale Yule. So we're reviewing a California beer, and I thought I'd do a beer from one of my favorite breweries that I've visited. That's Lucky Luke Brewing. They're in Palmdale and in Lancaster. The beer I reviewed is Phantom Falls. It's an American Imperial Stout with 11.5% alcohol by volume. It's a pitch black beer, little small tan head, Nice aroma, roasted malt, a little bit of uh, like charcoal. Mm. Has a very nice taste, espresso, unsweetened chocolate, and the char. Bit on the dry side, but a wonderful beer. Mm, sounds good. Well, let's open it up and give it a try. I haven't tried it yet. All right, Dickie, follow me down here to the quiet end. We have a really good story today. It reminds me a little bit of the Bart Whitaker case. Do you remember that one? I do. Yep. So it's pretty fascinating and yeah. disturbing. Disturbing. And there's no survivors, so there's nobody that's going to forgive Dana. No, that's true. Yeah, that was one of the remarkable things about the Whitaker case, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. it was. So it was pretty shocking when three family members were found dead in their affluent Fresno home two days after Easter in 1992. The crime scene initially looked like a burglary gone wrong, but much of the evidence didn't add up. There were no signs of forced entry, and the alarm system was off. Killer must have known the family and had to have had access to the Yule home. The victims were Glee and Dale and their 24-year-old daughter, Tiffany. The remaining family member, 21-year-old Dana, had an ironclad alibi. Now, in order to make sense of this crime, investigators had to get information on the Yule family. Did they have enemies? They did learn that Dale was a tough businessman who may have made enemies in his business dealings. Then it also came to the surface that Glee had once worked for the CIA. Yeah, so a little history of this family. Dale Yule wasn't born into wealth. He was really a self-made man. He was born in 1932 during the Great Depression, and he was the oldest of four sons, and he had one older sister. His dad, Austin Yule, was a farmer in Ohio who taught his children that nothing was given to them, but that everything they had they would have to earn with hard work. Austin worked hard. He had a 200-acre farm, and the children were expected to pitch in as soon as they could, so from a pretty young age. They had crops of corn, they had soybeans, they also raised cattle, chickens, and pigs. They always had enough to eat, but there were very few extras because money was always in short supply. But all of Austin's four sons were competitive and ambitious. Austin was known to be hard-hearted and controlling, and he expected them to grow up and be the same. Don't trust anybody. The word in the community was that the Yules would stop at nothing to get what they wanted, they knew no laws or ethics that were going to get in their way. It's not exactly a glowing recommendation, is it? No. Sound like he had a few enemies in the community, or at least not many friends. Sure. I don't know how much laws were actually being broken, but that seemed to be the impression. Because, you know, they definitely did believe in hard work, 
Austin told the kids not to trust strangers at all, and the highest value was put on the dollar. They did love their family members, but everyone else was on the outside, and everyone else was definitely on their own. As Dale grew up, he knew the rewards and the struggles of this hard labor, and after the beginning of World War II, he became fascinated with flight. You know, there were plants around the country building aircraft for transporting and for fighting the war. So this was actually known as the Golden Age of Flight, and it had begun with the necessities of fighting a world war. But Dale was really fascinated by airplanes, and he wanted to learn to fly. In 1950, he was 18 years old, and he went off to Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, where he majored in aeronautical engineering. And in 1954, he graduated on schedule and joined the Air Force. And he was thrilled because he learned to fly in the Air Force, and turned out he was pretty good at it. Yeah, he was assigned to fly many of the top generals in a twin-engine executive turboprop plane. This was a pretty high honor for a pilot, particularly as young as Dale was. When he was 25, he met his future wife, Glee, Glee Mitchell. Yeah, and Glee really couldn't have had much more of a different childhood than Dale did. She grew up in a very well-off family in Chicago. She was a super friendly young lady, soft-spoken, kind, and very social. So this was very different from Dale, who could be very socially abrupt and unsophisticated. Glee was actually named after her mom, Glee Irvin Mitchell, who was the daughter of an Oklahoma doctor, G.E. Irvin. Dr. Irvin had gotten lucky with real estate and oil leases in Texas, Missouri, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. So when he died, his three daughters managed his properties and shared the profits between them. So when Glee married and had a daughter she named Glee, they became Big Glee and Little Glee. And Little Glee spent her summers in Oklahoma. Her dream was to grow up and become a world traveler. So Glee went to college at the University of Arizona She majored in Inter-American Studies, and she graduated with honors in 1957. That same year, Dale left the Air Force and took a job with Douglas Aircraft, and that was located in Long Beach, California. Glee had stayed in Arizona after meeting Dale, and she attended grad school. She took a job with the CIA for two years and worked as an interpreter in Argentina. So they're both real go-getters. Now, Glee returned to the United States in 1961, and she and Dale were married. Dale soon decided he would rather fly airplanes than engineer them, so he took a position in Fresno selling Cessna airplanes. Now, many of his customers were farmers, so the job seemed made for him because he's got farming experience and flying experience. The commissions paid very well, and Dale knew how to talk to farmers. He actually developed kind of an original approach to making his sales. So instead of waiting for customers to come to him, Dale flew an airplane to the potential customer's farm. He would land on an isolated road or an empty field, taxi up to the house, and make his sales pitch. He would even invite the farmer for a ride on the plane. And he was always pitching the plane as freedom and status. He even offered flying lessons for an additional charge. And there was even a way for the farmer to claim the plane as farm equipment on his taxes. Well, sure, all you got to do is do some crop testing, right? I suppose. It seems a little shady to me. No. Why? Well, because you don't really need a plane to run a farm. Well, you need to keep your crops healthy. Right. I can see how it's workable. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if you want to be completely honest, they can't deduct the whole cost of the plane, but they can do a portion of it. Well, yeah, I guess that sounds reasonable. Well, sure. But just making one of these sales could bring Dale a commission of up to $10,000. And this was a while back, so that was a ton of money. Farming was actually very prosperous in the 1960s, and that's when Dale began to accumulate his wealth. He really had a substantial amount of money. In 1965, Dale left the Cessna dealer for a Piper dealership that was run by a guy named Frank Lamb. In the late 60s, Dale's three brothers also moved to Fresno, and the youngest went to law school, and the other two started a business that serviced agricultural operations for farmers. So they're all go-getters. And all of these brothers developed reputations as being very competitive, hard-headed businessmen. 
So it wasn't all good, and they weren't all well-liked by a lot of people. Well, they're just applying the lessons their father imparted them. Oh, absolutely. Right? Oh, sure. You could definitely see that. Now, in 1967, Glee gave birth to her daughter, Tiffany. And two and a half years later, in January of 1971, Dana Ewell was born. Also in 1971, the FBI arrested Dale's boss, Frank, and put him in jail. He was charged with using his planes to smuggle in marijuana from Mexico. Yeah, so at that point, Dale thought he was out of a job, and he was also worried for his family's safety. So he went out and he bought a 9mm pistol and two boxes of ammo. Then in 1972, Frank was convicted. Then Dale was called by the Piper Aircraft people, and he was offered the opportunity to take over Lamb's franchise. So this was a big deal. Lamb had broken the morals clause with Piper, so the franchise was just open and available. Well, that's a serendipitous thing. Well, it worked out really well for him as a dealer. Of course, the commissions were even bigger. So he was eventually able to move into a better location at the Fresno Air Terminal, and he named his business Western Piper Sales. And it became a really big success. All through the 70s and 80s, he basically made a fortune. Yeah, and his top salesman was Bob Purcell, and he followed Dale's pattern of flying planes out to the potential customer. So this meant that Purcell had to do a lot of flying, and it was often uh, under maybe less than safe conditions, fog, etc. Purcell felt that Dale was unethical and didn't treat him fairly. He would later describe him as someone who he had a love-hate relationship with. Dale always put himself first. And his family, I would say. But in 1992, when Dale Yule was killed, he was 59 years old. Now, not only did he own the successful Piper dealership, he also owned a fig ranch and a pistachio farm. He owned a house on the coast and also a mountain cabin in the Sierra Nevada mountains. He also had millions of dollars in the bank. So his net worth was somewhere around $8 million. So even though Dale wasn't seen as such a nice guy, it's believed that he was a good family man. He was probably really different with his family than he was in business. Glee's wife was very well liked and she was a person who just loved to help people. She was very intelligent, she was a devoted mom, and she also was more civically minded, so she actually did some good work in the community, which is something Dale didn't do. Yeah, so he's got his rough edges, but he's got this wife to balance them out. Seems like it. Sounds like you and me. <laughs> sure. So Dana was supposed to graduate from Santa Clara University in 1992. He was still living at home with his parents near Fresno. Now, in his freshman year at San Joaquin Memorial High School, Ewell claimed his goal was to be a multimillionaire by age 25. However, here he is, 21, nearing college graduation, and he's still being supported by his parents. He was smart and he was handsome, but he didn't have many friends. He just didn't fit in with them. He was pretty competitive and didn't go well with his classmates. No, I think he might have been a bit of a jerk. Well, it sounds like he was. Once he was in college, it didn't get any better. He was lying to his classmates, claiming that he was personally successful, and his own, in his own right, he was a self-made millionaire. He claimed to be a stock market genius, and he wore designer suits and carried a briefcase to classes. He said he owned his... He said he owned and ran his own airplane transport company, which of course was not true. So when Dale found out about Dana's lying and bragging, he told Dana, that's it, you're done, and just said after college, you're cut off financially. Whoa. So of course that didn't go over well with Dana, who was used to getting everything he wanted. Well, not just everything that was handed to him. Right, he didn't even have to ask. But now... His father's kind of fed up, and there were a lot of things over the years that Dana did that added to this. This was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, as they say. Yeah, it was kind of the culmination of things. It wasn't any one specific incident. So on Easter weekend in 1992, the Yule family spent the weekend at Pajaro Dunes, a second home on the water, which is about an hour and a half south of San Francisco. They planned to meet Dana's girlfriend, Monica, and Monica's family. Now, Monica's father was John Zent, and he was an FBI agent. 
Now, he is, his belief was that the Yules wanted to see Monica and her family to see if she was good enough for their son, Dana. So the way it worked was Glee and Tiffany drove down to the beach house on that Thursday afternoon, and then Dale flew in on Friday. On Saturday evening, Dana and Monica and Monica's parents drove down. And once there and having dinner with the Yules, the Zents really felt that the Yules weren't super impressed with Monica. And after dinner on Saturday night, the Zents returned to their home in Morgan Hill. And the conversation in the car was about Dale Yule, and that apparently he didn't seem to think Monica was good enough for his son. He'd been polite, but not super welcoming or warm towards Monica. But at the same time, he probably wasn't very warm and welcoming to anybody. Yeah, I mean, if they they knew his, his history, they might not have been as upset. Right, I think it was just him. Yeah, not her or the family. Yeah, because I think Glee was perfectly sweet with them. So Sunday, Dana left the beach house alone. He was going to drive his Mercedes to Morgan Hill and have Easter dinner with Monica and her family. Dale drove back to the nearby airport, and he was going to fly himself back to Fresno. Glee and Tiffany left the beach house together, and they are going to drive home in Glee's Cadillac. And as they're making their way home, none of the Yules had any idea that there was a killer waiting for them. No, a killer had entered their home Sunday morning. He'd gone through drawers and cupboards, dumped and thrown things everywhere. The guest bedroom's bed was stripped, and the killer spread a sheet out on a bathroom floor, then went through all the rooms and piled things that he wanted to steal onto the sheet. The sheet would have been piled with items including a stereo, CDs, a camera, jewelry, and that would be left behind so we'd know about that. In Tiffany's bedroom, her small TV was unplugged and put on the floor, and her clothes were piled up on the floor. In the master bedroom, the bed looked like it was purposely rumpled, and the closet was tossed. So in the closet, Dale had three guns. The killer put a 9mm semi-automatic pistol into a backpack he'd brought with him and then removed his own assault rifle from his backpack. His assault rifle took the same kind of bullets, so he loaded his gun with the 9mm bullets that Dale had kept in a box in his closet. So the killer had to know that was there. Once the killer decided what he wanted to steal and loaded the gun with the Yule's ammunition, He went into the laundry room off of the family room and waited for the family to come home, basically to just pick them off one by one. Yeah, Tiffany and Glee returned home around 5 o'clock. Glee parked in the single car garage. They unloaded a cooler and clothing from the car. They entered the home from the garage into the east wing hallway, turning right past the laundry room and entered the kitchen. They left the cooler on the kitchen table. Then Glee walked back toward the garage when the killer stepped out of the laundry room with a gun. He shot Tiffany once in the back of her head. She was probably dead before her body hit the floor. It's believed that Glee had seen her daughter killed. She ran for the office, but the killer chased her down. He shot Glee in her upper back, her upper arm, and as she lay dying on her back, he shot her again in the face. Yes, I guess Glee had met the killer. So, if she had seen who was killing her, she probably was aware that her son was behind it, just as she was dying. Heck of a way to go. Yeah. After the killer made sure that both of the women were dead, he went into Dana's bedroom to wait for Dale. Dale had landed in Fresno about 4 p.m., but he'd stopped in his office to read some mail, and he'd made a call to an aircraft engine supplier in Northern California, and he had an argument with him. Then he called some other people he had another argument with, so he was working on some problems. Then he left his office and drove home, and he arrived at home not too long after five. He parked in the two-car garage and entered the house through the same east wing hallway as Glee and Tiffany had, probably just minutes before. As Dale was walking down the hall, the killer ambushed him and fired one shot into the back of his neck. So, like Tiffany, Dale was dead before his body hit the floor. Now, their bodies weren't found until two days later, on Tuesday, the 21st of April. This is when the housekeeper came to clean their house. Rosa Avitia had been cleaning the house for over a decade. She and her two assistants arrived at the house before 9 o'clock. She rang the doorbell, but no one answered. 
Now, this was a little bit unusual for no one to be home, but Rosa did have a key. So she unlocked the door and expected to hear the alarm. She'd have about 45 seconds to turn off the alarm, but it was already turned off. So as Rosa and the other two women entered, they noticed right away something was terribly wrong. The house was trashed, complete mess. Then Rosa looked into the kitchen and saw Tiffany's bloody body sprawled on the kitchen floor. There was a dried puddle of blood beneath her head and upper body. So Rosa somehow managed to remain under some degree of control as she backed away. When they reached the front door, they were confronted by a man who was just about to ring the doorbell. That'll scare the shit out of you. <laughs> you know, you've just yes. discovered a, a ransacked house, a dead body, and you get to the door and someone's... Standing there? Standing there. Yee. Right. But fortunately, it was just a neighbor. But this neighbor had received a call from Dana Yule telling him that he was worried because he'd been unable to reach his family for two days. So he'd asked the neighbor to go over to the house and check on them. The housekeeper, Rosa, told the neighbor about the body in the kitchen, so he had to look himself, you know, typical guy, can't trust her, looks and sees the dead body for himself on the floor. So they all leave the house, go to the neighbors, and call 911. But, you know, violent crime in the Yule's neighborhood was pretty much unheard of. Most of the murders in the city of Fresno were, you know, in poor areas. They were poverty-related, or they were drunken domestic fights. So at the Yule House, four detectives did a preliminary walkthrough, and they quickly came up with two things that they thought were definites. The two women had been killed first, and the killer had waited for Dale to arrive before killing him, too. Despite all of the evidence to make it look like the house had been burglarized, they were pretty sure right away that this was staged. Yeah, according to one detective on the scene, the house was overly ransacked. They felt it was an attempt to throw the police off track of what these really were, executions. No signs of forced entry, no broken windows, no pried locks. The items put onto the sheet by the so-called burglar were not very valuable. And also, a real burglar would have been more likely to use pillowcases rather than sheets. Another thing they noticed, which a layperson might not know, was that the bureau drawers had been pulled out from the top down. Real burglars opened the drawers from the bottom up because it was quicker. And a real burglar would have been more likely to yank the drawers out completely. Yeah, another thing, Dale Yule's shotgun was lying on the bed still in its case, and a pistol was still there. So real burglars almost always take any guns they find. So the detectives were sure that the real motive was actually a cold-blooded murder of these three Yule family members. They have no idea why. Well, they probably had some idea if there's a surviving family member. Well, they're certainly going to look at that person closely. I would put him first on the list of person of interest. Well, from the appearance of Tiffany's wounds and from the location and condition of Glee's body, they were able to figure out that Tiffany had been killed first, and Glee had tried to run away. Dale's body was over in the hallway, so he had probably been killed last. Or the women would have seen him, right? So this meant that the killer had come into the house with the intent to murder them, and the burglary was definitely staged. And then we also had this issue with the security system. The house had motion detectors in several rooms, but none had alarmed, and Rosa said that the alarm system was off when she showed up. She said that had never once happened before. So this meant the killer either knew how to disable the alarm, or the killer knew the code. And detectives found the empty pouch for Dale's 9mm pistol on his nightstand. There was also a box of 9mm bullets on the nightstand, with one loose round on the floor. The gun itself was missing. Police felt that this was if the killer wanted them to believe that the stolen gun had been used to kill the family after they had walked in on a burglary. So I'm just, I'm always kind of impressed by detectives because how would you figure that so quickly? I mean, they seem to know right away this is staged. Yeah. They're trying to make us think this and that. I mean, that's, that's pretty sharp. I'm impressed. Yeah, we certainly have seen and read enough about shoddy police work. This sounded like pretty much on top of things. Yeah. And I'm sure part of that is the wealthy neighborhood, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. After the neighbor called the police, he called Dana Yule. He told Dana that he better come home 
but he wouldn't say why. Dana would later say that the call from the neighbor really scared him. He had asked the neighbor to check on his family, so the return call seemed ominous to him. Well, sure. But what Dana did was he contacted his girlfriend's FBI father right away and explained to him what was going on. So John Zent picked up his daughter, then picked up Dana, and he drove them to the San Jose airport to take a charter plane to Fresno. So before Zent got on the plane, he contacted the Fresno Sheriff's Department, and the person he spoke to asked if Dana was returning, and they asked Zent to please bring him directly to the Sheriff's Department. So you're right, I think they definitely want to talk to him. He's your first suspect. Which is reasonable anyway, because you always want to start and work your way away, right? Right. You want to start with the closest people. Work your way out. Sure. So the three of them arrived in Fresno around noon. The detectives were anxious to talk to Dana, who was the only surviving family member. They knew that Zent had learned of the murders, and they presumed that he had told Dana. So they wanted to see who Dana was and if he would be distraught. But they found that Dana did not seem very emotional after learning that his father, mother, and sister had all been brutally killed. Dana seemed very focused on details and on what would happen next. Well, yeah, because if this is his plan, okay, stage one is over. Let's get to stage two. Let's just move on with things, right? That's all it was to him. Yeah, let's get them planted in the ground and give me my money, and uh, off we go. He appeared very together. He was tall and thin and well-groomed. He was just 21 years old, but he was wearing clothes like he was a businessman. The other Yule family members tended to look like any other middle-class family, and it was Dana who was kind of a show-off and liked to wear designer clothing. But when Dana came to the sheriff's office that day, he seemed like a man in a hurry, a man with more important things to do. So that didn't seem right. His behavior and his demeanor just didn't match that of a grieving family member at all. He gave the immediate impression that he was the most likely suspect in his family's murders. So the police are on to him very early on. And they were very annoyed by John Zent's involvement. He was present when Dana spoke with detectives, and he wouldn't hesitate to interrupt. He kind of had that better-than-you attitude because he was an FBI agent. He's FBI. Yeah. But, you know, the police could have kicked him out. Didn't need to have him present when they questioned Dana. Well, Dana could have said, no, I don't want to talk unless I get a lawyer. Sure. So I think things. if that's the only way Dana's going to talk to them, that's what they tried. But it just makes me wonder... Did Dana bring him just for this reason? Dana wasn't a dummy. Maybe he thought, I have this FBI agent with me. It's going to be to my benefit. I would think so. I mean, it definitely gave him a sturdy alibi. Because John Zent was backing him up, that he had been in Morgan Hill with Monica and the family. And Dana said that his parents were religious about setting their alarm, and they never would have left it off while they were away for the weekend. Dana also said he knew of no enemies of his family at all. Yeah, and then he shocked the detectives by asking them when the police would be finished at the house and when he could make funeral arrangements for his family. That's when a detective told him it would take several days for the crime scene to be processed. Well, yeah, just the way he handled this, it really makes me think of someone who's like, well, this is the messy part of my plan. Let's get this over with so I can move forward and be rich and whatever. You know, if we're assuming that Dana's responsible. Correct. Right. So it was concerning to detectives that Zent was the first person who Dana had thought of to call because he had those three uncles he could have contacted for support. Ben, Richard, and Dan Ewell lived right in Fresno, and they certainly could have gone to the house to do the check instead of the neighbor, and they certainly could have accompanied him to the sheriff's office. So they really wondered if Zent was being used to give him a really good alibi from the beginning. That's a reasonable thought, I think. Definitely. So despite Dana's FBI agent alibi, there were things that convinced detectives that Dana was involved in his family's murder. They had the alarm system, the obviously staged burglary, and Dana's odd behavior. Doing this podcast every week, I pretty much live and breathe true crime. 
So when I need to lighten the mood and have a mental palate cleanser, my go-to refresher is Best Fiends. Best Fiends is fun because it's a unique puzzle-solving game that you can play anywhere, anytime. It has monthly updates with new levels, and you don't have to use your cell phone data or Wi-Fi to play. For me, it's a way to check out but keep my brain engaged at the same time. Like true crime, Best Fiends has a story that makes me think, but it doesn't have the bloodshed and legal twists and turns. One of the best times for me to play Best Fiends is when I want to be with you, Dick, but you're watching sports. Especially golf. I'm not much of a sports person, but I can still cuddle up to you on the couch and spend time with you without being bored out of my mind. You know, if you know what I mean, no offense. I know. And I enjoy Best Fiends, too. But I like to play it while waiting in line, or when you're watching one of your zombie or Lifetime movies. Well, I know, but you seem to get into them after a while. One of my guilty pleasures. (laughs) Best Fiends is a casual game that anyone can play because it's easy to follow. You can play for a couple of minutes or a couple of hours, because the game will pause and hold your place automatically. The Best Fiends characters are bugs, and their antagonists are slugs. This is a five-star rated game that's as challenging as you want to make it. Engage your brain with the fun puzzles and collect the cute characters. With over 100 million downloads, it's become very popular. It's a must-play. So download Best Fiends free in the Apple App Store or in Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Fresno County Sheriff Steve Majerian had gone to the scene that Tuesday morning. Crowds had gathered outside as the neighbors heard about the murders. Police closed off the street to keep reporters and curious citizens away, and they set up a mobile command center in a mobile home out front of the house. The crime was as shocking to Margarian as it was to the rest of the community. He had known both Glee and Dale Ewell. In fact, he knew Glee very well from her volunteer work on the Civil Service Commission. He knew her as a smart, warm, and considerate person, and he couldn't imagine why anyone would want to kill her. Yeah, and he was the one who first spoke with the media. Neighbors had been telling them about a string of burglaries that had happened over the past year, but Majerian said that the Yule murders were definitely unrelated. That burglar from the other break-ins had been caught a week earlier and was actually in jail, And that past Easter weekend, the police had driven this burglar around the neighborhood as he confessed to the burglaries. So it couldn't have been him. As the crime scene was processed, evidence technicians removed bullets from the walls. And there was something very unusual. These bullets had these prominent marks on them. And a forensic scientist determined that the bullets had been fired through a silencer. So that's extremely unusual and weird. Very unexpected. But after canvassing the neighborhood, it kind of seemed to make sense. We know that there had been five shots fired, but no one had heard anything. One neighbor said he had heard some unusual noises coming from the Yule house between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. on Sunday, but no one else heard anything. So a silencer kind of makes sense with that. And it does. Yeah, and the detectives decided, yeah, the killer probably did use a silencer. And no random burglar would come into the house with a silencer prepared, especially for a weapon that he shouldn't have even known was there, right? Because if you're thinking it was Dale Ewell's gun that was used, how could someone come in with a silencer for that gun? That's really impossible. So this was all more evidence to them that this was an inside job. Yeah, and then investigators called the alarm company and had the Ewell's home alarm system tested. It worked fine and there were no signs that it had been tampered with. There was only one way to get into the house without setting it off, and that was by climbing up on the roof and going down through the skylights. And they checked those, but they were sealed shut, so that's not the entryway. No. Well, late Tuesday, the Yule's bodies were removed from the house and taken in for autopsies. And there were really no surprises. Dale and Tiffany had been killed by the one gunshot from behind, and Glee had been shot three times as she tried to get away. Based on the information from Dale's office and the condition of the bodies, the murders took place late Sunday afternoon, between 5 and 6 p.m. John Zent was with Dana again the second time he was interviewed, 
and Dana brought with him a receipt from a Morgan Hill drugstore that had the time and date on it. So this proved that he was in Morgan Hill Sunday afternoon. He also had a receipt from a grocery store where he and Morgan had purchased food for Easter dinner. So it's just a little weird that he had these receipts. Some people keep receipts, but most people don't keep grocery and drugstore receipts for more than, you know, a couple hours. They get home, they get rid of them. Yeah, they don't keep them. Not usually. Now, during the second interview with, with the police, Dana suddenly remembered that his father actually did have some enemies. So he brought up his former employer, Frank Lamb, and his salesman, Bob Purcell. He also mentioned some lawyers who would refuse to pay their repair fees for their airplane engine. This was apparently who Dale had been arguing with when he stopped in his office Sunday before heading home. So Dana is expressing concern now. Well, maybe I'm in danger myself. Yeah, so Zent told investigators that Dana's receipts completely eliminated him as a suspect. And this made them wonder, maybe Zent had been coaching Dana and giving him advice, and that's why he'd brought up these new possible enemies and said he was concerned. Investigators took Dana on a walkthrough of the house, and he showed no emotion then either, even when he saw the bloodstains. He seemed really concerned about the condition of the house, and he asked the police if they had taken anything out of the house, like acting as if they were going to steal things. (laughs) So just a real dick. Let's just say the cops hated him. They did not like this guy. Now, so if Dana was responsible for his family's murder, then he must have had help. So they were wondering if a 21-year-old would have hired a hitman to kill his family. It was certainly obvious that the family had wealth, and Dana was the only person who would inherit the fortune. But it was unlikely that Dana would have had the connections needed to find a professional assassin. No, investigators had to be careful about pointing the finger at him right away. I mean, if he wasn't involved, it would be terrible to accuse someone who just lost his whole family. But the media was already speculating. The sheriff told reporters that Dana was not a suspect. Before the detectives focused on Dana, of course, they had to eliminate the other possibilities. They didn't want to get tunnel vision. So they interviewed Dale's business contacts, and that included Frank Lamb. Lamb and Dale had each sued each other, at least twice, and Lamb denied any involvement but said that Dale's death was not a complete shock because he was a vicious businessman who often pissed people off. But that wouldn't explain the murders of Tiffany and Glee. A business enemy could have killed Dale in his office or while he was traveling. Yeah, that would be pretty drastic for someone to kill his whole family over a business issue. It would have been. But Bob Purcell suggested that Dale's murder could have been a mafia hit. He didn't know what he was involved in, and he wasn't very fond of Dale. The two lawyers who were angry about the engine repair bill were pretty much eliminated because it just seemed really unlikely that they were going to go have three people killed over their $1,700 bill. Now, there were some rumors that Dale had been involved in drug smuggling. Dale had had to testify a few years earlier in a federal drug trafficking case and it was alleged that Dale had allowed one of his planes to be used for smuggling, but there was never any proof that Dale had taken any money from smugglers. So when they looked into Dale's brothers, investigators learned that they weren't particularly close with Dale, but still they found no motive why they would kill him or his family. Another thing they had to consider briefly was Glee's involvement in the CIA prior to her marriage to Dale. But that job was 30 years previous, and... She'd been an interpreter in Argentina, so there really wasn't any reason connected to that why anyone would want her dead. Yeah, so investigators kept coming back to the fact that the murders were an inside job. Someone had to know the alarm code and had to know that the family was away and had to know that they would be arriving separately. They also had to know the basic layout of the house and that the Yules would come in through the east hallway. And the killer also had to know about the 9mm bullets in the master bedroom, and they had to have a silencer prepared for Dale's gun. So these facts kept bringing suspicions back to Dana. Well, I mean, really, where else can your mind go with all these facts? I know. While detectives were still processing the crime scene, an old friend of Dana's came by to see what was going on, and he spoke with one of the detectives. 
and he asked if they had considered the possibility that Dana was responsible. And when asked why he would say that, he told them that Dana was obsessed with money. He said that Dana was perfectly capable of killing his family if it meant that he would inherit a fortune. A glowing recommendation. Right. So it's just kind of funny that they're seeing all these signs of that, and this young guy comes by and says, well, sure, you better look at him. Yeah. So the focus of the investigation definitely became Dana with time. Detectives went to the Santa Clara University campus to interview his teachers and dorm mates. Professor told them that he had a disturbing experience with Dana months back. Dana was taking an ethics class, and the professor accused him of plagiarism. Then Dana had sent the professor a threatening letter, which he gave the detectives. So in the letter... Dana wrote about having strange thoughts about watching shows about serial killers and wrote that he didn't want to do anything wrong. Certainly a bizarre letter and something that could be taken as a threat. Yeah, so I don't know why something wasn't done more about that when it happened. At the time it happened. Sure, right. right. I would think expelling him might have been a possibility. So you have to wonder, did his wealth have something to do with that, with him getting away with that? So after they talked to the people at the college, it became clear that Dana had been living a lie. He'd been telling everyone who would listen that he was a self-made millionaire. He'd even been profiled in different newspapers as this young, successful entrepreneur. A story in the college newspaper had elevated Dana's standing, and Entrepreneur Magazine and the Mercury News wrote articles about him. The Mercury News article reported, At age 19, Yule is a self-made millionaire who amassed his fortune playing the stock market, running two companies, and selling mutual funds. And of course, this was all untrue. Dale was the self-made millionaire, and Dana had told the reporter that he and his investors had taken over a bankrupt airplane dealership and made $4 million in sales in 1990. So, really kind of far-fetched if you think about it. He was 19 years old at the time. So he's really building himself up to be this precocious genius. So many of Dana's classmates described him as being an annoying and elitist person. He claimed to have an IQ of 180. He was a good student. He clearly lacked modesty. And he just loved to show off his wealth. He drove a 1989 gold Mercedes. And after he totaled it in an accident, his father had been sure to get him an exact replacement so no one would know about the accident. Yeah, so what do you think about that? It feels like he was enabling him. Well, certainly. His father was kind of setting himself up for this kind of kid. Well, with that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, not making him take responsibility for that. You know, like it'd be too embarrassing for him to say that he crashed his car, so we have to cover it up. That's a little weird. Now, Dana didn't have many friends, and even his relationship with Monica seemed based on what he could gain from being with her. So then detectives heard about Dana's only close friend, and that was Joel Radovich. Joel was the so-called bad boy in the dorm. He dressed like a bum, and his room was a mess, and this is exactly the opposite from Dana. But according to other students, Dana and Joel were just inseparable. Now, Joel also had a criminal record. He had been caught stealing furniture and was kicked out of his dormitory. So as detectives began to look into Joel's background, the beach house in Pajaro Dunes was searched. Dana admitted to one detective that he had taken the spare Fresno house key from the tool shed where it was normally kept, and he'd done this just days before the murders, but he denied making a copy or giving the key to anyone. Near the end of April, less than two weeks after the murders, Dana and his three uncles went to Dale's attorney's office for the reading of the will. The assets included $3 million in cash that was in various banks, and at least $400,000 was immediately available to him, to Dana. The airplane dealership, the real estate, and a $1.2 million pension would have to go through probate and then into a trust. But the sole beneficiary was Dana Yule. The trust was structured, though, so Dana would receive money in stages, at ages 25, 30, and 35. So the poor kid. (laughs) Right? It's a rough life. Yeah. 
but according to Dana's uncles, Dana was super angry about this. He jumped up and banged his fist on the attorney's desk and kind of whined, why did my dad do this to me? So the uncles were really stunned by this behavior, and that's when they began to believe that Dana was definitely behind the killings. And worse yet, his only motive was money. How incredibly cold and calculating. Then one day after the will reading, Joel Radovich confessed to his brother Jack that he had killed the Yule family. Joel started by saying that if there was a God, he was screwed. He said he had murdered the three family members just after they arrived at their home in Fresno. He said that he had gone to the house early in the morning while it was still dark. He spent the entire day there preparing and waiting. Once inside the house, he had put his gun together and sat on some sheets of plastic he had brought with him. He did this to avoid leaving any DNA. So while telling his brother about the murders, Joel drew the layout of the house. He explained how the family arrived separately, how he shot the daughter first, then the mother, then the father. He said that all three of the family members appeared to be dead, but he checked for pulses to be sure. Then he waited in the house for several more hours until it was dark again. He had taken the 9mm pistol from the house as a cover weapon, trying to make the police believe the killings had happened with the homeowner's weapon during a burglary gone bad. He also had taken some cash from the house. Jack asked Joel who the victims were, and he told him to watch in the paper for the name Yule. Right, so Jack is Joel's brother that he was telling all this to. But Sean Shelby was a young guy who had known Dana Yule for years, and he was the one who told detectives right after the killings that he believed Dana was absolutely capable. So then he attended the funeral, and his suspicions were solidified. He said that Dana was very relaxed and unemotional. And after the funeral, Dana had called Sean, and he told Sean that the police had bugged his house, but he sounded almost like he was bragging and found the whole thing really entertaining. Dana told Sean about his alibi and told him how to deal with the police if something like this ever happened to him. So detectives wanted to know everything that Sean knew about Dana. They'd grown up together since junior high. Sean said, first and foremost, Dana was just a rich, spoiled kid. He loved to show off his money. His father gave him a monthly allowance of $500. Once, Sean was visiting Dana's house, and he saw a $100 bill lying on his bedroom floor in a pile of clothing. So that's just awful to me, that a kid would be that spoiled and not know the value of working hard, right? Yeah. Well, in high school, Dana liked to show off and buy food for everyone in the cafeteria. And he even hired a limousine to drive him to school a couple times. Dana also paid other kids to do pranks for him. And he even talked about paying someone to rob his parents' house. To Dana, money bought him control, and he enjoyed manipulating people. Sean recalled a junior high teacher once asking their class, if they could think of the fastest and easiest way to make money. And according to Sean, Dana had raised his hand and answered, kill your parents. So as investigators continued to interview any associates of Dana, they got very interested in Joel, Joel Radovich. Detectives finally reached him by phone and set up a face-to-face -face meeting. So Joel said he barely knew Dana, and he was sure he wouldn't be of any help but the detective said, we really want to sit down with you. So Joel's getting nervous. Before agreeing to meet, he asked, are you going to arrest me? But detectives assured him they only wanted to talk. So that's so, not a good question to ask. It isn't. No. So I guess uh, his brother didn't call the police when he was confessed to? No, he didn't. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Well, Joel's question about being arrested, of course, set off some alarms in the detective's heads. They were pretty sure that Joel at least knew something that would help in the investigation. In their interview with him, Joel said that he didn't know Dana well, that he was just a guy in the dorm. Dana and he really had nothing in common, and besides, Joel was a couple years older. But this wasn't matching what the other students were telling them. The other students had said that Joel and Dana were frequently in one another's rooms, and they were often seen walking on campus and talking together. So Joel, of course, was asked about where he was on Easter, and he said that he was at Hamrick's, that's an auto body shop, and that the owner knew that he was there all day. 
Right. Well, that's easy to check out. Yes. But it, it's a little complicated. Most things are. They tend to be more complicated than we think they should be. Absolutely. So by mid-May, Dale Ewell's brothers and their wives were certain that Dana was somehow involved in the murders. They put together a $25,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. Dana declined to contribute any money. And the more the three brothers talked about it, the more convinced they became that Dana was responsible. But this is still unthinkable to them. I mean, this is their nephew. I can't imagine how horrible that is. Right? Yeah. I mean, just having a brutal murder in your family would be awful. But then to realize it was a family member, that's a lot to deal with. Oh, yeah. This is their nephew, after all. Right. And Dale and Glee had loved and cared for this kid their entire lives. So the idea that he would kill his parents and sister, especially for money, is just beyond disturbing. There's something missing in a person that can do that. So when the brothers brought up their concerns with their father, Austin Yule, Austin revealed that he too was suspicious of Dana. Yeah, looking back, they all agreed that there had always been something kind of off-putting about Dana. From a young age, he could be cruel, selfish, dishonest. And as he got older, he became more arrogant and more shallow. He was just this materialistic guy and apathetic, particularly to other people's troubles. Yeah, and looking back, some family members would say that he was never nice to his sister. He used to torment her a lot. You know, and not in the normal way that siblings do, but really in kind of a horrible way. Now, after the murders, Dana was absolutely indifferent to the deaths of these three people who should have been the three people closest to him. There were so many little things that just weren't sitting well. There was his rage about the money, not all being given to him immediately. And then when he ordered the caskets, he'd bought the cheapest one available for his sister. He also refused to pay $35 for a flower vase for his dad's headstone. And he actually said that would be a waste of money because he never planned to visit the grave anyway, which sounds very cold. He might as well just put up a sign on his chest or something saying, I'm guilty. Well, it seems that way. Yeah, and he doesn't seem like he's being very good about showing any concern or grief. He actually moved back into the murder house in May and didn't even bother to have all the blood cleaned up. In fact, he seemed to find it kind of entertaining to show people the blood. So with Dale gone, the Western Piper airplane dealership began to fail. Dana seemed like he thought he was going to take over the business, but he really had no idea what he was doing. He actually showed up a few days after his family was murdered. He was driving his dad's car and carrying his dad's briefcase. Then he kind of glad-handed the employees, but then he went into his dad's office and never really came out. So nobody knew what he was doing in there, but he definitely wasn't running the business. Yeah, now the various accounts that Dale and Glee had, and Glee was responsible for her mother's estate, gave Dana about $800,000 immediately. And since Glee's mom was in a nursing home, Dana completely controlled her finances. And after his grandmother died, he would also have the income from her oil properties because they would have gone to his mother, who's dead, and he gets the benefit. Right, yes. So all this money provided a strong motive, especially for someone like Dana, who seemed to love money more than anything else. Well, as detectives investigated him, they really dug further into his false claims of being this self-made millionaire and how that had upset and embarrassed his parents. Dale had actually been furious with Dana. Much of what they had learned from people who knew Dana, the best, portrayed him as having antisocial tendencies and even a capacity for violence, even though he had no history of violence. The working theory, though, became this. Dana had decided that he needed to get rid of his family in order to get rich quick without any hard work. Then he made this plan. He needed someone who he could manipulate to do the actual killings as he put together an ironclad alibi. So Joel Radovich was someone he could definitely manipulate. He could become his best friend and offer him money from the estate. So the plan could have been that diabolical. Like actually befriending Joel with that in mind. With the intent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and Joel certainly met Dana's criteria. Joel had few friends. He was estranged from his parents. 
He was very impressed with Dana's wealth, and he was a risk taker. So investigators decided that Joel was likely the killer working with Dana. Now, after his interview with detectives, Joel seemed to have vanished. They were unable to reach him by phone, and no one seemed to know where he was. Then when he was finally seen, turns out he was living with Dana in the murder house. Yeah, Dana had been put under surveillance, and Joel was seen at his house, but it took almost a year for the undercover detectives to identify that that was Joel living there. If they'd only checked the license plate number or took a picture of him, they would have known much sooner who that was living with Dana. So that was a mistake they made there. But then finally, identifying Joel confirmed suspicions about Joel and Dana being in on these murders together. As they watched the house, it was clear that Dana and Joel were really close. They looked happy together, laughing and joking a lot, and some of the detectives even wondered if maybe they were lovers. Huh. We don't know. So an interview with the owner of Hamrick's auto body shop, the owner said that he didn't remember Joel being at the shop on that Easter Sunday. But at the same time, he said he had short-term memory problems. Now, he did remember, however, Joel had told him that he'd seen him on Easter Sunday. Right. So he had told the owner, you saw me on Easter Sunday, which really isn't helpful for an alibi. It's not an alibi at all. No, no. So when Joel's mother hadn't seen Joel in weeks, she said he had been less communicative. He would call her on the phone occasionally but he wouldn't tell her where he was. Now, Joel's brother Peter said that he kept in contact with Joel by calling his pager. He couldn't remember the numbers, but the letters of the number spelled out K-I-L-L-A-J-R. Right, Killa J-R. Killer Joel Radovich. So that's pretty obvious right there. If that's not a clue, I don't know what would be. But after learning the pager number, detectives did page Joel numerous times, and he never answered. And then two weeks later, the account was canceled. In mid-July, Dana hired lawyers, and he let it be known that he wasn't going to be cooperating with the police in their investigation anymore. His reason, he said, was because the detectives were completely incompetent. So, I don't think the detectives were incompetent. They did make some mistakes. And unfortunately, there just wasn't a lot of evidence there. I mean, for one thing, they could find no evidence that Dana or Joel had ever had a 9mm firearm. Dana had been really smart when involving John Zent in his alibi, too. Because Zent, he's an FBI agent and he was really critical of the detectives, which seemed to add credence to Dana's decision not to cooperate. Well, sure. You've got this hotshot FBI agent who's telling him that the cops are a bunch of idiots. Yeah, and yeah. you don't have to cooperate? And he said, well, that's what the FBI agent said. So it really did help him out more than you might think. So detectives visited the pager company, and they found a refund check for the service that had been co-signed by both Dana and Joel. And the address was that of the murder house. So that confirmed that Joel was living with Dana, and they were more than just casual acquaintances. That November, FBI agent John Zent wrote a letter to the local newspaper criticizing the sheriff's department for their treatment of Dana, and he said that the detectives were grasping at straws and he would continue to support Dana. So I don't know what his game is, if he really thought Dana was this innocent kid. It's really kind of hard for me to know where he was coming from doing this. You know, usually you would think that law enforcement people would support each other, but he seemed to be very critical of the sheriff's department. To Bob Purcell, who still worked at the Western Piper Airplane dealership, it seemed really possible that Dana had murdered his family. Dana seemed to be trying to become his father, taking on all of his achievements as his own, and he did recall some issues that had come up with Dana when he was younger and how Dale had always tried to cover for him. Yeah, and detectives were able to get access to Dana and Joel's financial records. Joel had no job, but he was living a pretty comfortable life. He was taking $1,400 helicopter flying lessons, and that September, he had earned his helicopter pilot's license. Dana had been taking money from his grandmother's account, and he was financing Joel. Yes, so detectives interviewed many of Joel's former acquaintances as well. 
and one of them said that Joel had bragged to him that he would be a millionaire before he was 25, and he bragged that he had a cut-proof plan, whatever that meant. A Santa Clara University student named Tom told detectives that Joel had stayed with him at his parents' house in 1991, and while staying there, Joel had asked Tom if it was okay to have some magazines delivered there. One time, Tom forgot to follow Joel's instructions not to open one of the packages, and he did, and one of the magazines was a manual on how to make silencers. There were actually 10 books in the package, and they all had these weird topics. They included silencers, explosives, booby trapping, and wiretapping. So Tom was pretty upset with Joel because he knew it was a federal offense to make silencers and to do many of the things in these books. Detectives got a search warrant for the phone records of a payphone that Joel was frequently seen using, too, and the calls he had made were to two other payphones and to a number registered to Dana's dorm room. So they believed he was in pretty frequent contact with Dana. Certainly sounds like it. Yeah. So there, a year goes by, and the Fresno Bee published a story of the murders. Dana soon issued a statement blaming the media for making a tragic situation even worse. He claimed that reality had been distorted, and the stories were doing a disservice to the memory of his family. <laughs> yeah, like he cared about that. Yeah. He returned to Santa Clara University, but he seemed to be always looking over his shoulder, and he was evading detectives. Joel seemed more oblivious. He talked on payphones, and undercover officers were able to overhear his side of conversations. Right, so in April of 93, Joel was overheard demanding money from someone over a payphone. He was talking about traveling around the world, and he was demanding $25,000. Surveillance of Dana suggested that Dana was the one he was talking to. So the police were able to get a duplicate of Joel's pager. So every time Joel got a page, an officer would get that same page, which was pretty clever. And from this, they were able to verify it was Dana who was paging and talking to Joel. And there were even comments about the murder, which they were using some kind of secret code that didn't fool anybody. And they referred to the murder as the three shirt deal. Yeah, but I mean, I hope all of our listeners remember pagers. Before cell phones, you could have a pager. Someone would call your pager, and that would mean you call them back. You'd give them your number. I think most people probably know that. I think so. But they aren't around anymore. It's been a long time. Don't need them. This was the 90s. So in May of 1993, detectives went to Dana's dorm room. He peeked out of the door, and a detective told them that they thought that Joel Radovich had killed his family. Now, Dana looked pretty upset. He ran out of the dorm and sped away in his Mercedes. Minutes later, Joel's pager and the duplicate pager went off. So a little circumstantial evidence, but many of these things were starting to add up. Yeah, then in June of 93, undercover detectives heard Joel ordering an electronic lockpick, and he wanted it delivered to someone named Jack Ponce. Detectives hadn't heard of Ponce, so they went to his San Bernardino address to find out more about him. So what was this lockpick for? Ponce wouldn't say, but there was a possibility that Dana was making plans to murder his grandmother. He'd been taking money from her estate, then he moved her from the facility where she'd been for almost 10 years, and put her in a newer place closer to Joel Radovich. So when detectives talked to the administrator of the facility, that Dana had moved his grandmother out of. She said that Dana had told them she no longer could afford to live there. And when detectives contacted the new facility, they learned that Dana had put his grandmother into a room with a door that opened to the outside. In fact, Dana had insisted that she get that room. So the electronic lockpick may have been purchased so that Joel could enter her room and kill her before she used up her money that Dana wanted for himself. (laughs) It just gets better and better, doesn't it? Isn't that just sad and twisted? Your grandmother. Yeah. And it's pretty nasty of him to move her from the old room to the new room. That's just... Well, he had to make it more convenient for her to be murdered, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's all it was. So after hearing about the lockpick, detectives gave photos of Joel Radovich to the nursing home. 
and asked anyone who saw him there to call the police immediately. They were also able to eventually convince the nursing home to move her to a more secure room. And Dana was blocked from taking her outside the facility. Though Jack Ponce denied knowing Joel and denied knowing anything about the murders. It was difficult to get information from Ponce, but he did continue talking to the police. In one interview, Ponce was asked about any guns he owned. He said he owned a pistol, rifles, and a shotgun. When he was asked if he had ever owned a 9mm, he said yes. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I think this was really one of the more exciting breaks for detectives. They wanted to know if he'd ever given that gun to Joel Radovich. Ponce claimed he didn't know where the gun was, but he'd never lent it to Joel. The detectives were able to get a gun of the same model that was made near the same time as Ponce's gun, and they made a silencer as described in the book ordered by Joel, and they also fired the gun, and the markings on the bullets matched the ones that they had found in the Yule home. Also, they shot the gun, and the sound of the gun was muffled. Silencer worked. Yeah. So this evidence, though, is all circumstantial. But still, it was now strong enough to make some arrests. Yeah, so in March 1995, Dana, Joel, and Jack Ponce were arrested. Dana and Joel were each charged with three counts of first-degree murder. The DA made a deal with Jack Ponce. He agreed to tell the investigators everything he knew about the murders, and charges against him were dismissed. He admitted to buying the gun, but denied knowing that Joel planned to use it in a murder. So prosecutors described the case as a planned hit. They had 95 witnesses, and they had the ballistic evidence. But Jack Ponce was really the key to their case. He testified to buying the 9mm assault rifle with money given to him by Joel Radovich. And he said that Joel committed the murders in order to split the $8 million inheritance with Dana. So neither Dana nor Joel testified in their own defense. According to jurors who spoke with the press after the trial, they put together their own timeline based on the evidence that they felt was really inarguable. Many of them were parents, and they said they had a hard time emotionally accepting that a son could have plotted the murders of his entire family for money. And the jury actually deliberated for 11 days. It's a long time. Of course, it was a long trial, an eight-month trial. Wow. Yeah. But what the jury did is they ended up throwing out Ponce's testimony because they thought it was unreliable, and they really believed that maybe he was more involved than he was saying. At one point, he had slipped in his testimony, and what he said made the jury believe that he was possibly at the murder scene with Joel Radovich. Of course, it's too late to do anything about it. He's already got a deal. Right. So on May 12, 1998... Dana Ewell and Joel Radovich were found guilty, and for three more days the jury deliberated over whether they should be sentenced to life or put to death, and they were deadlocked, so the judge sentenced them to three life terms in prison. Yeah, so with the death penalty, you have to have a unanimous vote. Right. Right. But at sentencing, Dana talked about how much he loved his family, and he claimed that he was innocent. But in the end, Dana didn't get that money he wanted so badly. The estate was turned over to other family members, and now he's in prison. He's in a protective housing unit of the California State Prison in Corcoran. So some interesting things about Monica Zent, his girlfriend and the daughter of the FBI agent. She actually went on to become an attorney. She was investigated, but her involvement wasn't proven. She did continue to be involved with Dana Yule, though, for years after the murder. She was with Dana in his dorm that time police visited his dorm in May of 93 and told him they believed his friend Joel had committed the murders. And she was also with him in his Mercedes when he drove away and paged Joel that day. Dana was taking money from his disabled grandmother's estate, and Monica received over $39,000 from that estate. Also, $17,000 was paid from that estate, to the University of San Diego Law School, where Monica was a student at the time. She also had bought a handgun with her own credit card, which was later found in Dana's possession. (laughs) Yeah. So she didn't testify in Dana's trial, but her father testified for the defense. So very suspicious with her. This was actually found out years later and published, kind of outing her. 
on the internet because she's a pretty successful lawyer. So your uh, father still think uh, Dane is innocent? Well, he did in, in 95. I mean, he might have changed his mind. We don't know. He might not even be alive anymore. Who knows? Right. But Monica did break up with Dana before he went to prison, so. Yeah, well, she got, out of, <laughs> she got what she needed out of him. Didn't she? Wow. And it, it seems really hard for me to believe that she didn't know anything about it. If she was taking all this money. I mean, I guess he could have told her that he inherited this money because his parents were killed, but just the behavior that he was doing. She had to know about Joel. Yeah. She was with him when he did one of those pages to let Joel know the police were there. You got it. Yeah, but I guess they weren't able to prove anything. So she's a she's a lawyer. Yes, I'm sure she's a successful lawyer. <laughs> well, seems to be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Our sources for today's episode, Forensic Files, episode 282, titled Two in a Million, a book titled Seeds of Evil by Carlton Smith, the Los Angeles Times archives on this case. There is a show, Power, Privilege, and Justice with Dominic Dunn from September of 2003, and that's titled Tailspin. There's an American Justice, episode 170, about this case, and quite a bit out there about it. There are some blogs and other things, so it's a fairly well-known case, but I had never heard of it. Me either. Pretty interesting. Yeah, definitely. So our beer review contest deadline has passed, and we're going to be playing the winning submission on next week's episode. Probably. What do you mean, probably? I'll get to it. Well, come on now. We have to give people a direct date. Okay. Well, that uh, gives you a whole week. Got it. Okay. And the winner is going to get a wonderful pair of my favorite Bluetooth earbuds, so I can't wait to send them out to somebody. Would you like to get some extra ad-free episodes of TCB? Our commercial-free members-only episodes come out every month, plus there's a backlog of about 40 episodes that are yours to listen to as soon as you join. You can sign up to be a tie grabber for as little as $4 a month. And when you join, you have your choice of a Welcome to the Brewery gift, which we'll send to you with a nice handwritten thank you note. Just visit tiegrabber.com and click on subscribe to learn more. And just a reminder about our shop. We've got lots of things that you might enjoy having. Check them out. Yeah, we've gotten some emails asking where someone can buy a shirt or a glass, and it's all right there on the website. So we're going to move on to feedback. If you have a case suggestion or comments about a crime or even a beer, we encourage you to send us a voicemail. Now, I've said it a lot of times, but we do have a widget on our website right on the right side of the screen. And if you click on that, you can record a voicemail for us, which we love to get. But if you're too shy for that, we'd still be very happy to get an email with any of your comments or suggestions. And you can send those to truecrimebrewery at tigrabber.com. Okay, on the feedback. Let's start with a voicemail from Ansel. She left a beer review and a case suggestion. Now for today, we're just going to play the case suggestion. Hi, Jill and Dick. My name's Ansel. Um, I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia. So the other thing, though, I wanted to do is recommend a case. Uh, it happened in a little town called Brackendale in British Columbia. A man by the name of Bob McIntosh was murdered when he went to a New Year's Eve party at a friend of his house who he knew was away for holidays and his kids were partying it up. And he went to go break up the party and he was murdered. And then it was followed by kind of an unusual five years long stretch code of silence by everybody that was involved at the party. I don't know if that is something, I don't know. It just, it was very strange. They could not arrest anybody because nobody would say anything. Anyway, there's some interesting aspects of that story. Yeah, that's it. I love your show. I watch you guys, or watch you guys. I listen to you guys every week. And I even go back and listen to the your old ones because I forget after a while. And I, they're just as good to listen to the second time around. Okay, take care and keep on doing a wonderful job. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ansel. That was a great voicemail. So I guess no good deed goes unpunished. Isn't that right? With this neighbor, huh? Well, the, yeah. I mean, the, the little bit that I was reading up on, this guy Bob McIntosh gets asked by his neighbor to keep an eye on his house because it's uh, New Year's Eve, 1997, and uh, neighbor's kid was going to be having a party. This was a teenager? Maybe early 20s, but a, a young kid. So, and, and Bob says, sure, I'll check for you. And the party turned out to be just what the neighbor was afraid of. It was loud and raucous. There's like 150 kids there. It was just a mess. 
So Macintosh went over to quiet things down and apparently talked to the wrong people because he got beaten to death by some of the party goers. Well, that is just amazing. There's no way you could predict that. That's no kidding. outrageous. And as Ansel said, it took several years because Jeez. they nobody would talk. This was not a good group of kids. Apparently not. No. Wow. I guess, you know, the lesson there is call the police. Don't go over yourself. <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we have an email from Daria. Daria's got an email. And this is a case suggestion. Yes, she says, I've been listening to your podcast for a really long time and love it. A lot of podcasts only stick to the facts and don't always give their take on it, and I always like hearing what you two have to say. I have a suggestion for you if you're interested. I listened to a podcast episode by Criminal on this case, and I would love to hear you both cover it. And this is about Evelyn Nesbitt and what's going on. So this is another one of those ancient cases. This is from the early 1900s. Ah. We did the Starvation Heights one, which mm -hmm. was 1912 or something like that. Well, yeah, we kind of talked about that. We thought, you know, let's do a historic crime. Every couple of months we'll do one. Yeah, so this might be one we want to do. Yeah. So Evelyn Nesbitt was a model, and this is in the early 1900s. And she had posed for the noted artist Charles Gibson and became a Gibson girl, which is pretty important back then, or was. And she eventually became a stage actress in New York City. And that's when she came to the attention of the noted architect, Stanford White. White was not a nice guy. He paid close attention to Evelyn, eventually raped her. But even after that, she became his lover. So that's kind of a twisted story. Mm -hmm. Maybe she had no choice. Possibly. Knows. Yeah. She, at age 20, married a guy named Harry Thaw. And this guy was a millionaire, but mentally unbalanced. And... Thaw had a thing for Stanford White. He knew about what he had done to his bride, Evelyn. So on a rooftop restaurant of Madison Square Garden in front of a hundred or more people, Thaw killed Stanford White. And he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, and he was committed to a psychiatric facility for life. Well, it sounds like this Stanford White was not a sympathetic victim. No. If you're going to kill someone, he's probably somebody that could use a little killing. <laughs> well. <laughs> no, no, but you know what I mean. He was not a nice guy. No, he was a rapist. But committed for life to a psychiatric facility, there must be a lot more behind this. Yeah, well, yeah. like I said, he had plenty of money. Yeah, but so. he was a little bit crazy. More than a little bit. Yeah. Okay, well, I would just like to read about that for the hell of it anyway. It's okay. interesting. Well, we'll check it out. And then we have case suggestions from Evelyn. Evelyn writes, I would like to suggest four cases for your consideration. Great cases. The first one is Kelly Forbes murdered her husband, Michael Forbes. The second one, Tracy Todd murdered by married boyfriend in Chicago. And the third one, Jennifer Shipsy murdered by her boyfriend, Paul. And then the fourth one, Nalia Franklin murdered by angry ex-boyfriend, Reginald Potts. Yeah, so those cases all were fascinating. I just chose the second one, Tracy Todd. To talk uh, about? To talk about. But we'll look into all of them. Yes. Yeah. But first we're going with Tracy. Sure. Tell me a little bit about Tracy. Well, without giving too much away, she was a flight attendant, and she disappeared in the year 2000. Three months later, her dismembered body was found, and her boyfriend, Kevin Williams, was arrested and found guilty. This guy turned out to be married. Well, he's the one that was found guilty. He was sentenced to 60 years in prison. Now, the interesting thing about this, and Evelyn told us this, I hadn't heard about it. When he was a two-year-old, William's mother was killed in a similar fashion to Tracy Todd. So, I mean, there could be a little bit of uh, nature versus nurture going on there. Do we know what the motive was? Was Tracy Todd pregnant? Sounds like he was trying to get rid of her. No, she was going to tell the wife about their affair. Oh, that's like match point. Yeah. Although she was pregnant. Well, that sounds really interesting to Doesn't me. It? Sounds uh, like that's up my alley. I hope I can find enough info. Yeah, definitely. But Thanks, we'll, Evelyn. We'll give it a go. Sure. Thank you, Evelyn. Yeah. So I forgot to say earlier that our music was written and produced by Tristan Capel. Don't forget Tristan. No. Okay. I'm going to go drink some more of the beer. All right. Well, I hope everyone's doing okay. And we will definitely see you next week at the quiet end. Down at the quiet end. All right, bye-bye.
Bye, guys.